we're fast approaching the end. In, in fact, um, uh, tonight we'll wrap up our study in the seven churches of the book of Revelation. So if you would turn to Revelation chapter number three, we're moving through these churches and this is church number six this morning that we're looking at, the church at Philadelphia. Uh, tonight we'll finish up with church number seven, the church of Laodicea, and it's uh, it's amazing that these two churches are addressed back to back um, because they are polar opposites on the spectrum of spirituality. I want to remind you something that we've talked about in some of these churches. I just haven't mentioned it in every one of them. That this church or this church today, the church at Philadelphia, it's the church with an open door. That's the the message that we're we're looking at this morning. But I want to remind you something about these letters. Jesus. Jesus has addressed seven churches, all in Asia Minor, and it might help you sometime to go to the back of your Bible, in your Bible maps, and locate these, locate these cities. And you'll see they're all uh, generally around the area of modern-day Turkey and relatively close proximity to one another. There were more churches than just these seven, but God picked these seven churches and he addressed them and put that address in his eternal word. And so there, God wants us to know some things about these churches and learn from these churches. So we've said this throughout, that we can look at these churches through three different perspectives. First of all, we can look at them practically. The practical reality is that these were seven literal churches that existed like this one, Believers gathering together, worshiping God, hearing the word of the Lord, and these letters were addressed to them. None of those churches are functioning today. They all died out. But at one point, these were seven literal existing churches. And then you can also look at them prophetically. Uh, these churches can represent the different periods of church history from the beginning of the church through the rapture. And we've been careful each time to point out the various time periods. This particular church, the Philadelphia church, represents that period between 1700 and 1900 AD. I should say AD, right? Uh, I'm assuming you knew that. During this period, like this church, numerically weak, maybe not financially powerful, but they began a modern missions movement. From that period of 1700 to 1900, there were some tremendous revivals in this world. Uh, if you're familiar with the Great Awakenings, they took place from 1700 to 1900. The Philadelphia Church represents that, and we'll talk about this in just a moment. Uh, it's a relatively small church, perhaps the smallest of the seven. Not known for its great, uh, great wealth like Laodicea that we'll talk about tonight. Laodicea may, may have been one of the wealthiest churches of the seven. Maybe even more wealthy than Ephesus. But Philadelphia wasn't. And yet they seem to have had the greatest spiritual impact. You can look at these practically or prophetically. You can also look at them personally in that Every one of these churches has something to say to you and I in our church today in the 21st century. We learn from them. We learn from uh, some of them how not to do things at your church. Uh, Philadelphia, though, this is a wonderful church. And there are some great things we can learn from them. This city, the city of Philadelphia, was located at the end of a narrow pass um, when we, lived out in, when we lived out in Bozeman, Peggy just recently moved here from, from Montana. When we lived out in Bozeman, Montana, there was a pass that ran between Livingston and Bozeman. Uh, and it, it's just a wicked little pass. It's a wind tunnel. And I mean, uh, we would go through there sometimes, and I don't see them here. I don't know if they're allowed in our state or not, but in Montana, you could have triple bottom tractor trailers. And we'd go through that, uh, we'd go through that, that Livingston Pass sometimes, and those triple bottom trailers would look like a snake going through. It's, it's Interstate 90. I mean, it's four lanes, you know, two lanes going one direction. But that tractor trailer would be in front of you, and it'd just be doing this because of that wind. You're like, well, we're not going to pass that in here. Uh, well, the, and, and at the end of that pass is the city of Livingston. Well, Philadelphia, this church, this church here, it was at the, at the end rather of a pass between two mountains. It literally was a doorway into, uh, into the pass. 
And it sat there and, and it, it made for a great strategic location because if enemies were going to invade and come through that pass between those two mountains, Philadelphia did not really have to mount that large of a force to hold them back. They just clog up that pass and they would hold the army up as long as they needed to before help could get there. The city was named after a man whose name was uh, King Attalus II. And you say, how did they get Philadelphia out of, uh, how'd they get Philadelphia out of a name like King Attalus? What's interesting is that Attalus was known for the deep love that he had for his brother. His name was Eumenes. And he, he loved his younger brother. And they founded this city and named it Philadelphos or Philadelphia. And you know what that, you know what that word means. It means the city of brotherly love. They named that in his honor because he was known for the love that he had for his brother. The problem was Philadelphia, if you know much about Turkey, and some of you have even been stationed there in your military uh, careers, Turkey is built on a geographical fault. Turkey is known for its, uh, it's also known for its earthquakes. And this city was known for its frequent earthquakes and so much so that at times the citizens would flee the city so the buildings didn't fall on them. Like the other cities, they also had a bunch of pagan temples there. What's unique about them is their temples were not necessarily do, uh, dedicated to the Greek gods, or to the Roman gods, but to the Greek gods. They were a more ancient pagan culture. I don't know that that helped them all that much. And the most unique thing I think about them is that Philadelphia was the last of the seven churches to lose its Christian light. The church there uh, thrived really until 1000 AD when Muslims finally took the city. But they lasted longer than any of them did. And one thing that you'll notice about the church at Philadelphia, and this is significant for us today, is that Jesus does not give them one word of condemnation. Nothing he says to them is in rebuke. They're the smallest of the churches. Financially, they may be the weakest of the churches. And yet what Jesus has to say to them, to say to them is just commendation after commendation after commendation. And he gives them encouragement after encouragement after encouragement. If Faith Baptist Church is going to model ourselves after any of these seven churches, let's model it after this one. Let this be the one that we try to emulate. Everything they did, according to Jesus, they weren't perfect people. They didn't do everything perfectly, but everything they did was pleasing to God. And, and I want to look at this morning, this church with an open door. Now, I, I want to be careful. And some of you, you have to go back a few years to remember this. This is not the church of the open door. There was a church years ago called the church of the open door. We're not pushing that at all. So this is the church with and open door. Paul uses that phrase earlier in his epistles where he's talking about there's an open door of opportunity before me. And this church had an opportunity and it took it. And God blessed this church. So I, I want us to look this morning in Revelation chapter number 3 and verse number 7. And let's read these verses about the Philadelphian church. And let's discuss why I think if we're going to emulate one of these churches, let's emulate the church at Philadelphia. All right, verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation." which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. 
Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Boy, that's an interesting passage of Scripture, all these things being written on this church and all these things said about him. Let's look at this for a few minutes today and talk about this church that has an open door. God himself said, I have set before you an open door. And church, I want you to know, Faith Baptist Church, I want you to know, you have set before you in this day that you and I live, we have set before us an open door. You are living in the time period and in the country and in the family that God designed for you. You and I are not here by accident. God has put before us an open door. We've got to figure out what are we going to do. Are we going to take advantage of the opportunity? God's opened the door and he said this. Did you see how he introduced himself? And we'll come back to that in a moment. He said, I open a door. Nobody's going to shut that door. And if God has set before a church an open door... We're foolish if we don't go through it. Cooperate with what God's doing in your church. That's, this is the message. Philadelphia is a wonderful church. Let's look why. First, I want you to see in verse number seven, the church and her master. The church and her master. He comes and he introduces himself as he does in each of these churches. And you can go back and read. Maybe it would do you well to go back and read chapters two and three together and just watch how Jesus introduces himself, uh, himself personally and individually to each church. He doesn't introduce himself the same way at all. This church has needs of encouragement, so he, he uses particular titles for himself. This church needs to be rebuked, so he has particular words that he describes himself with. And he comes to the church and he introduces himself, and I love the way he does it. The church... And her master, let's look at the master's attributes. There's two very powerful things he says here. First, he says that he is the sinless one. He says in verse number seven, these things saith he that is holy. Holy, sinless, pure. The Bible talks about this in so many different ways. We don't, boy, I wish we had time to turn to these, but I I always, uh, Terry knows my process, I I put the sermon together and then I spend Friday and Saturday usually trimming my sermons down so we're not here till two in the afternoon. And I put more scripture in here than we have time to turn to today. But let me just rehearse this idea about the holiness of Jesus because we don't want to miss this. He comes to this church that's living in a pagan community, in this church that are surrounded by people who uh, are idolatrous, uh, they're, they're immoral in their worship. And first thing he says is that he's the sinless one, he's holy. The Bible tells us that he's holy. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 22 says that in him was no guile. There was nothing that uh, creates a shadow or a deception. And then 1 Corinthians 5.21 describes Jesus as the one who knew no sin. He didn't have any sin at all. The Bible, the Bible gives the testimony of Jesus as being holy. Did you know the demons say that Jesus is holy. Jesus came across a demon-possessed man in Mark chapter number 1, and he confronts this man, and before Jesus could say hardly anything, the demon comes back, and, and this is what he says to Jesus. I know thee who thou art, thou holy one of God. Even the demons know about the holiness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Jesus himself, uh, in John chapter 8, he asked this question. He said, Which of you convict me of sin? And I imagine after he asked that question, there was a pause. And there were also crickets chirping because there's no answer given in there. Nobody could convict him of sin. Why? Because he's the sinless one. And he's telling these Philadelphia believers who are surrounded by pagans, they're surrounded by non-believers, they're surrounded by people who do not have anything like the values that they have. Jesus is saying... I'm the holy one, and I can make you holy. I will, I will enable you to be holy. Not only is he the, uh, the sinless one, and all of us need that encouragement from time to time. 
You and I need to be reminded he's holy, and through him you and I can live holy lives in an unholy world. You can do that, Christian. You don't have to compromise your life with this world. You can follow God. He's the sinless one, but he also says he's the sincere one. Did you see that? At the end of verse number 7, or, or at the middle of it really, I guess, these things saith he that is holy, he that is true. True. He that is genuine. I appreciate people, um, when computers first came out, the phrase was WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get. Do you remember that? Any of you computer people remember that? What you see is what you get? That was, a, was that not a fantastic breakthrough in the computer world when you could see on screen exactly what it was going to look like on the paper? Used to, when you type something out on a screen, you had to tell it to bold this or underline that or to italicize this, but you couldn't see it on your screen. And then somebody came up with this idea of what you see is what you get. And on the screen, when you print it, it's going to look just like that on the paper. I appreciate people who are like that. I don't like having to discern people if, have, if they have ulterior motives or not. Jesus is saying, you don't have to wonder about me. I am genuine. I am true. He is the real Savior. Keep in mind, like these other churches that we're talking about, the things that this church was surrounded by were false. They were, they were surrounded by false teachers, by false doctrine, by false, uh, by false churches. All Everything around them was anti-God. And Jesus comes and he says, I want you to know, I'm the one that is true. I'm the one that is genuine. You did not make a mistake when you turned from idols and turned toward the true God. I am the true God. He's reassuring them of that. That's why Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other. There's only one true God. The, the idea that the world has, the mentality that the world has, that all roads lead to God is absolutely false. Don't, don't apologize when you're talking to your unsaved friends. Don't apologize to them that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It is a narrow-minded thought. I, there's no way around this. There is one way to escape hell. There is one way to get to heaven. There's not many ways. It doesn't matter how sincere the Muslim is. And many of them are more sincere than we are in our Christianity. But they're sincerely wrong. And they are sincerely in jeopardy of hell. Jesus comes to this church and he says, I'm sinless, I'm holy, and I can make you holy. And I want you to know, even though you're surrounded by all these false doctrines and all these false teachings, and some of them sound good, and some of them sound promising, and some of the people following those false teachers, they're prospering. But I'm telling you, I'm the one that's true. There is no salvation in any other. There are substitutes for everything today. I have, to, I have to use Splenda, not sugar. Not by choice. I'm forced to it. Kicking and screaming. Substitute sugar. That's what, I, that's what I have to deal with. Some of you have to deal with salt substitutes. So far, I'm, I'm good with that. I still get to have my salt. Sugar substitute. Salt substitute. There is a substitute for anything. Fake leather, artificial intelligence. There's all of these things. Jesus is saying, that is not me. The only thing substitutionary about Jesus Christ is his death on the cross for you. Everything else, he's not a substitute. He is the true one. I'm sinless, he said, and I'm sincere. That's the attributes of this one. When he comes to introduce himself to this church... He introduces himself as the one who is sinless and the one who is sin sincere. So he tells them about himself and his character, his attributes, but he also, second, tells them about his authority. He starts talking about keys. Did you see that? And it was an interesting phrase that we only find one other place in the Bible. He says these things in verse 7 still, that he is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David... He that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. That's an interesting phrase, talking about the, the, the end of that verse, talking about the master's authority. First, it says that he carries the keys. It says the key of David. 
in Isaiah chapter 22, and for sake of time, we won't turn there, but you could write it down and check me out. Isaiah 22, verses 20 through 25. The Bible talks about this man named Eliakim, and it says some interesting things about Eliakim. It's an Old Testament prophecy saying that God's glory and God's power are going to rest upon this man's shoulder. He will be set, as it it says, he will be set as a nail in a sure place. He will have the key of David. And later, this, this man, Eliakim, would be cut down and fall. Now, if you're connecting any dots, connect these. That's Jesus Christ being crucified. That's the one on whose, on whose shoulders is going to be placed the government, the nail fixed into the tree. All of those things are pointing me, they're pointing you to Jesus Christ. The Old Testament prophesied about a man to come who would have the key of David. That phrase is not mentioned again until Revelation chapter number 3 where Jesus raises his hand. He says, I'm the one that has the key. He has the authority. What, what does it mean if you have a key? We talked about this earlier, we talked, and I don't remember what message it was a while back. We talked about having keys. Remember that? What does a key get you? Well, a key, it, it speaks to access. You, you have access. If you have a key to a certain building, you can get into that building. If you have ill intent, you can get into that building with or without a key, apparently. But if you have a key, you have the authority To access that building. Jesus is saying in here, I have the key. You know what else it says? Do you remember in Revelation 1.18 we read, Jesus said, I have the keys of death and hell. What is that saying? I've got authority over it. It says in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 19 that he has the keys to the kingdom of heaven. You know what's interesting in that? It says in that verse... He'll share that authority with you, give you the keys of the kingdom as a believer in Christ. What he's claiming here is his authority. He's telling you, I have the keys. I have the keys of David. I have the keys over death and hell. I have have the keys to the kingdom of heaven. He has the authority. He's holding the keys. One of my favorite, maybe my all-time favorite male Christian artist, singer, is Steve Green. I love Steve Green. I wish he was still singing as much as he used to. Um, he, he, he didn't write many songs, but he sang fantastic songs. One song that he released in the late 80s was called He Holds the Keys. It starts out in a minor key, and the accompaniment's great to it because the setting is death and hell. And, and the second verse, I wrote this, the words down, the second verse of that song says this. His grave becomes a door. He enters in to face the author of all sin. Defying death and the grave, he takes their keys, and with them, every captive frees. And from death's barren womb, the captives cry, arise, for our redemption draweth nigh. Now, how did he do that? Because he has the keys. Jesus not always only tells them about his attributes and his character, but he tells them about his authority. And he says, first, I have the keys. If I want to get into a certain building, i got to find out who has a key holder. I, uh, our police officers, they get called to these buildings every once in a while where an alarm is going off. And I'm listening to it on the radio, and I know what's going to happen. It's, a, it's 99 times out of 100, it's a false alarm. These pre- police are just running all over getting these false alarms. If you've got an alarm system, make it work so you don't run the police officers ragged. Would you do that? But inevitably, they come across on the radio, and they'll say, have you been in touch with the key holder? The policeman wants to know if the key holder, and that's what they call him, has the key holder been contacted? You know why? Because the dude that has the key is the one that has the right to be in that building. The key represents the authority. It represents the access. He says, not only do I, I have the keys, I've got the keys. It also says that he controls the doors. He has the keys and then it says he opens doors that no man closes. He closes doors and no one's opening. He's the doorkeeper there. Hold your finger at at Revelation 3. Here's a good example of what he's talking about. And you may already know where we're going. Back to Acts chapter number 16 and read about Paul. This is a great example of the one holding the key and the one who opens and closes doors. 
Paul's a missionary trying to discern what field do I go to? Where should I go next? My ministry here is done. I need to go to the next place. Where should I go? Look at Acts chapter 16 and verse number 6. It's on page 154. Verse 6 says, Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. That last phrase of verse number 6, you can read it like this. The door closed to go to Asia. And the Holy Ghost did that. Verse 7, after they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. Door number 2, closed. Jesus in Revelation 3 says, I'm the one who opens the doors, I close the doors. Verse number 8, and they passing by Mysia came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he seen, had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Verse number 10, door opened. That is a wonderful example of Revelation chapter number 3. In your life, you're not a missionary trying to go to a foreign field, but you have decisions you have to make all the time. If you will seek the Lord's leadership, if you will trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding, but acknowledge him in all your ways, he'll direct your path. What does that practically mean? He will open and close the doors to direct you to your, uh, to your place of, of, of service, where you ought to be. This is Revelation chapter 3. Jesus is saying, I have the keys. That gives me the authority to go in. And I, I control the doors. I open and close opportunities for you. And let me say this. Once you know, listen carefully, once you know that God has opened an opportunity for you, go through that door. Obey him. Don't, don't him haul around. Why, why do you need to do that? Once you know God has opened a door before you, go through it. And so, Pastor, I don't know all the details. Well, of course you don't. I don't. We're not God. That, of course we don't know the details. That's why we're to walk by faith and not by sight. But if the Holy Spirit says, don't go through this door, don't go through it, don't go through this door, don't go through it, Paul, but then... The Holy Spirit says, this is where I want you to go. I want you to go to Macedonia. Then just go. And you know what Paul said? Immediately, we determined to go to Macedonia. Once you know God has opened the door, go through it. You know one of the dreads that I have about the judgment seat of Christ? The doors I did not go through that I should have. That I was confident God was leading and my lack of faith kept me from going through it. Let's not be that. Let's make those dreads fewer and fewer. Don't miss those opportunities. But let me say this. And I, I wrote myself a note in here. If he's closed the door, no matter how bad you want to go into it, don't go. If he's closed it, do not try to kick that door open. You will frustrate yourself. You'll be more successful at pounding your head against that wall over there than you will against going against the will of God. It just won't work out well for you. The path of blessing is found where the Lord wants us to be. So as he is opening and closing doors for you and closing doors for me and opening doors for me, let's determine to go through them. There are times when God lines things up for the church and makes it clear where he wants you to go. And he may, he may require you to exercise faith to go through it. But if you'll go through it, you might have to swallow hard. But if you'll go through that door, God will bless your obedience. Some of you might still be struggling with your faith, faith promise for this next year. Some of you might still be struggling with what Chris Lapino said about faith, that you need to determine what amount of money to faith promise missions causes you to live by faith. That, that's the first time I ever heard it put as drastically as he did. And he took our little faith promise missions card and he just started there, well, $1, that doesn't require any faith. $5 doesn't require any faith. $20, ooh, I don't know about that. Do you remember he talked about that one? And I, I said it was a guy who, who determined it was, do uh, you remember this? $400 a week. 
And I said, it was a guy with $400. Chris stood up here and corrected me. He said, Mark, he said, that wasn't a guy. He said, that was a single lady. And her faith wasn't tested until $400 a week. That's amazing. Now, I'm, not, I'm not saying you need to give $400 a week. What I'm saying is God opens up a door, go through it, even if it requires our faith. Can I give you, our church family, can I give you a wonderful example of that? How many of you, when we first started this idea of an EABM training center in 2019, talking about a project where the property was going to cost perhaps a quarter of a million dollars or more, and the building would cost at least that or more, how many of you thought we'd be talking about the conclusion of that building in less than five years? But in 2019, we just kind of swallowed hard and said, if this is what God has us to do. And we walked through a door, and God gave the property, and God worked in a bunch of churches, and that property was paid for with cash. And then the building started to be designed. And then it worked out that because of the property that was bought, over $250,000 was saved because there was already a foundation on the building, so the building cost is actually a half of what it should have been originally. And now we're less than $30,000 away from the entire cost of the brand new building that might be completed by September 2023. Amen. That is amazing. You know what that is? Amen. Here's an open door that God opened and a group of Christians said, let's walk through it and just see what God does. And God did it. And I'm saying that that just doesn't happen corporately for churches. That happens for individuals and for families as well. When God opens the door, go through it. Well, we got to hurry along. First thing is the church and her master. Jesus introduces himself and says, this is who I am. Second, the church and her ministry. And that's really the bulk of this passage, verses 8 through 11. The church and her ministry. This, this was a small church, but a lot of potential. First of all, their ministry involved opportunities. In verse number 8, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. The church... Uh, the church's ministry involved opportunities. They had a little strength, and can I tell you, we don't really know what that is referring to. It's probably talking about their lack of numbers in the church and their lack of financial, uh, their, their lack of finances. It's probably what it's talking about. They were a poor church and they were not a big church, and yet God was using them in a great way to impact their city. How was he doing that? Well, the scripture tells us they had kept his word. They were walking in obedience. They were pure and they were strong in their doctrine. They were not compromising on the word of God. The other thing is that they had not denied his name. They were not ashamed to stand for God. They stood on things that needed to. Their relationship to God was that important. They didn't keep the gospel to themselves. Even though everyone around them was pagan, they shared the gospel with them. They kept his word. They didn't deny his name. And, he, and because of their faithfulness, God blessed them. And those same, those same things are true today. Look, it's no secret. Let's be honest. It's no secret that Bible-preaching churches that stick to a literal interpretation of the scripture are losing popularity not just in our country, but in our world. That's not a secret to anybody who is keeping track. Everybody knows that you, you can't stand on certain street corners in this world and preach the unadulterated word of God and not go to jail. You can be arrested in Australia for preaching the gospel and being charged with hate speech. You saw maybe about two or three weeks ago on Fox News the story that the FBI is looking for ways to classify certain speech by the Roman Catholic Church as hate speech in the United States of America. And I'll, I'll say what I said three weeks ago to you. They're not going to stop at the Roman Catholic Church. That's their open door. And, and so we have to stand like this church stood he said, I, I know you're weak, but, but there's some things about them. You've got this open door before you. Why do you have this open door? Because they'd kept God's word. They'd not denied his name. Their ministry involved opportunities, and so does ours. We have opportunities to minister. The question is, are we going to stay with it? Are we going to stand for God's word when it's not popular? Or perhaps, listen, when it's not legal? 
All of you are familiar with the, uh, John, the John MacArthur's church through the COVID shutdown out in California. They're, they're in the process of producing a, uh, they're in the process of producing a documentary, not just on that event, but on governmental persecution of the church through history. If you get an opportunity to see it, you need to, you need to watch that movie. It's supposed to come out sometime this summer. We have to determine if we're going to keep his word and not deny his name if those things become illegal. That's what this church was standing on. Their ministry involved opportunities. In verse number 9, it also involved opposition, didn't it? He talks about those people, the synagogue of Satan. Those which say they are Jews and are not. Those things are talking about lost people. They claim to know God and they claim to love God, but they don't. In your notes, you can write down Romans chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. That talks about those which say they're Jews and they're not. Professing to love and follow God, but they don't. And Jesus promises them there, I'm aware of the mistreatment that you're suffering. I know that they're opposing what you're doing, that they're standing against you in the gospel work. I know that, but he tells them whatever is going to happen now, eventually they're going to acknowledge truth. He puts it like this, one day they're going to bow at your feet. Now, not worshiping them, that's Jesus' way of saying one day they're going to recognize that what you told them was absolutely true. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. Well, the church at Philadelphia, they were preaching that 2,000 years ago. They were preaching to the Philadelphians about the gospel of Christ. And Bible preaching churches are not as accepted as they used to be. It's going to get worse. But Jesus' promise to Philadelphia is the same to us. It will be worth it. So stand. There is opposition. And God knows about that opposition. We need to practice 2 Timothy chapter 2 and, and or 2 Timothy 3 verse 14. It says, Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and been assured of. Look, I know that in certain parts of our country, in certain applications, the word Baptist doesn't even mean what it used to. I'm ashamed that that church out there in Kansas, at Westwood Baptist Church, I'm ashamed that they have the word Baptist and church in their name. They ought to lose both of them. They're neither Baptist, and they certainly are not an, a Christian church. We have to continue in the things that we have learned historically and biblically. Don't worry about mockers and don't worry about skeptics. You may catch flack at work for your Christian stand. It may cost you at work. It may cost you in your family. God's in control. Vengeance belongs to him. Obedience is for you and me. So the, their ministry had opportunity, but they also faced op, uh, opposition. And the third thing in verse number 10, their ministry involved optimism. As I said, Jesus had no words of condemnation for them. And here he gives them some hope. Because thou hast kept my, the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Personally, I believe he's referring to the coming tribulation of the world. I don't think this was a... Uh, I don't think this was necessarily just for their time when, when um, they were going to face persecution because he references tribulation that's going to come upon all the world. In fact, it says there in verse number 10, to try them that dwell upon the earth. That last phrase literally means earth dwellers, and it's used a lot of times in this book. This is only the first time we're going to come to it, but we're going to come to it several times, and it refers to that world system, people that do not know the Lord. And there's a great period of tribulation coming for them. They are going to face God's wrath. We're not going to debate that here this morning. There is a great tribulation coming, and Christians are not going to be a part of it. And that's what he's promising them there in verse number 10. I will keep thee from the hour of temptation, the hour of testing, the hour of tribulation that's coming to the whole world. You remember that phrase that Adrian Rogers used? He said that the days in which you and I lived are growing gloriously dark. That is a wonderful way to, opt, uh, to have an optimistic attitude on the darkening of this world spiritually. Gloriously dark. Jesus said, when you see these certain things happening, look up. Your redemption draweth nigh. Those things are happening. So they are glorious to the Christian as we come to the end of this age. Jesus is going to take us out of this world. He's going to keep us from this hour of temptation that's coming to all the world. Not for Christians, though. You've been delivered from his wrath. 
Their ministry involved opportunity and opposition. There's this optimism here. I'm going to get you out of here before it gets really bad. And the last thing is their ministry involved obligations. What are they to do in verse number 11? Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. They have two obligations here. First, they're to watch for the coming of the Lord. He's coming quickly. Second, they are to watch how they walked, how they lived in their lives. Keep what you have. Keep what you have. Jesus is coming, church. We need to live like we understand he could come any time. His return, someone said, is imminent. It means there's nothing that has to happen before Jesus raptures the church out of this planet. It could happen any time. So live like it. What do you want to be found doing and glorifying and prioritizing in your life when Jesus comes? I'd be doing that. Why? Because he could come in the next second. Don't you hope that he finds you in church? Not in a bar? Not in a fight? Not cheating on your taxes? We're getting to that season. Don't you hope that when Jesus comes, he finds you doing something right? How can we do that? Do what's right all the time. Live in light of eternity. Live as if Jesus could come anytime because he can. What are the obligations here? Watch for the coming of the Lord. He says, behold, I come quickly. I come suddenly without warning. It's not talking about the speed at which he's coming. It's talking about the suddenness of his coming. And then watch how you're walking, how you're living. Don't allow the world to take that away from you. You and I can't know, here's the truth, you and I can't know the extent of our impact on people around us until we get to heaven. So keep influencing people by where, the way you live your life before you go to heaven. I have to move right along. The church and her master, the Lord Jesus Christ. The church and her ministry, it's what we do while we're here. And the last thing is the church and her message in verse number 12. Jesus leaves him with these words, Him that overcometh, I will make him a pillar of the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name, this, this message. First, it's a message of stability. <coughs> he says that they're going to be set as a, a pillar of, in the temple of my God, and go no more out. You know, I said a moment ago that the city of Philadelphia, being where it is, it's built on a geographical fault line, and so they were subject to these terrible earthquakes, just like we have now. How many times in your lifetime have you heard of earthquakes over in Turkey that kill over 10,000 people at a time? This, was go this has been going on uh, for, for thousands of years. And to avoid being crushed by these falling buildings, these people would flee their city. They would go out of their city. Jesus is promising them stability. There's going to be no more fleeing. This is a message of stability. I'll make you a pillar in the temple of my God, and you will go no more out. No more reason to fear. No more reason to flee. The world that you and I live, it may quake. It may rock and it may reel and evil men and evil women may come and go. Troubles and trials do that all the time. But we've put our faith in a God who said, I'll give you stability. I'll establish you. I'll make you rooted and grounded. Remember all those words that Paul and Peter used? It's, t it's giving us this message of stability. Not only a message of stability, but this message of security. I like the way he said, you see, he writes his name, he writes a name on his people in three different ways. He says, I'm going to write these names on you in three ways. First, God's name will be put on you. That establishes ownership. God says, that one's mine. That one's not. That one's mine. God establishes ownership. Then the city's name will be put on them. Why? Because that's their new home. Remember that old hymn? I think it was page 84 in the All-American hymnal that I grew up with. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. You have a new home, and God's going to write not only his name on it, but the city's name. You're living in earth today. You're living on this planet today. This is not your home, Christian. And then the last thing it says, a new name for Jesus will be put on them. I, th I think it's just because this is the bride of Christ. These are, these are his people. There is a special relationship here. The, 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 the name of Christ also speaks to the fullness of Christ. 
You get all of him when you get saved. And when we get to heaven, we will see him in that fullness. We don't now, obviously. He's not visible to us now, but one day we're going to see him. So he, he, writes this, he, he writes this name after name after name on the believer. And he's giving them this idea of security. They did not live in a secure place. It wasn't secure for them physically with these earthquakes going on. It wasn't secure for them politically or religiously because of the opposition that they faced. And he gives them this message of stability and this message of security. And, and I, I, I would describe it to you like this. There's a wonderful phrase in Hebrews chapter 7, verse number 25. And this is what it says. I don't remember the beginning of it, but it, it says this. If you've been saved, if you're a genuine Christian, it says, we have been saved to the uttermost. Isn't that a descriptive phrase? What does that mean? You are as saved as you possibly can be. You, you can't be any better saved. It doesn't matter what your past looked like. It doesn't matter how you came to Christ. You have been saved. The choir sing, one of the songs we sing, I, I think it's that redeemed medley that we sing, it talks about us being saved to the uttermost. That is straight out of scripture. You can't get any more saved. You are that secure in Christ. You are that stable in Christ. And this is the message that was given to this struggling, this small, this spiritual church. Jesus is saying to them, I've got you. And church, in the days ahead, I want you to know, God's got you. No matter what happens in your life, no matter what goes on in our political world, no matter what happens in Ukraine or Washington or Beijing, God is in control. He's given us this stability. He's given us this security. It says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 6, it speaks of believers. If you imagine this, it speaks of believers as if they are already in heaven who are still living on the earth. That's how secure you are in Christ. God sees you as if you were already with him. That is fixed. That is, that is so comforting to us. I, I'd like to have been a member, I think, of the Philadelphia Baptist Church, wouldn't you? God says nothing to them but good things and encouraging things. Of these seven churches, this is the one to emulate. It is a blessed congregation, struggling, absolutely, but blessed. Why? Because they kept his word and they hadn't denied his name. And God said because of those two things, he starts a litany of things that he's going to do for them and has already done for them. So what you and I ought to do is stay the course when it comes to the word of God. In your life, in your family, in your church, on the job, wherever it's at, stay the course. God's fixed us. Here's, the two, here, here's two things. This wraps it up for us today. Keep watching for the Lord's return and keep working in his work. Uh, you know, there's a special crown. Paul said there's a special crown promised to those who love his return. Watch for his return. Look for him to come. And let that looking, let that thought that Jesus may come at any time, let that determine how you live your life. Let it determine how you make your choices. Well, I'm going to do this or not going to do this. Why? Because I'm looking through the lens of eternity. I'm going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ one day. This is how I want to determine my life. Look for the Lord's return, work in his work. So here's the invitation today. If you're not saved, you need to come to Jesus Christ this morning. If you don't know for sure that you're saved, if you're wondering about that, well, I was baptized when I was a kid. That's not Bible salvation. Pastor, I've been a pretty good guy. I've kept most of the commandments all my life. Jesus said you have to keep all of them every day of your life and never break even one. Well, I've never killed anybody. Have you hated? I've never, committed, I've never cheated on my husband or wife. Have you ever committed lust? You see what I'm saying? What I'm trying to prove to you is none of us are without sin. Every person ever born has sinned. And the, one who, or the two who weren't born, they were created, they sinned. That's just what we do as humans. We sin because we're sinners. But Jesus Christ has provided a way out. If you're not sure you're saved... Come today and let someone show you from the Bible how to be saved. The second thing is this, if you're already saved, but you're not watching for Christ's return. The second coming of Christ, the rapture of the church even, it's not determining how you live. 
come and confess that to God and say, God, help me to live in light of eternity. I'm, I'm telling you, this world is not your home. Some of you are not going to be in this congregation next year. You're not going to be alive next year. A week ago, our sister Irma Gilliam was alive. Today, Irma's in heaven. Some of us are not going to be here next year. So what time you have left, live it in in light of eternity. If you're not saved, come and let someone show you how to be saved. If you're saved and not walking with Christ like you should, Come and rededicate your life to Christ. Does that word, does that word frame it correctly? Come and, come and confess to God. God, I've not been what I should as a Christian, but I want to. You know what the great thing is? Jesus said, I'm holy. I'll help you be holy. He'll give, he'll give it to you. He gives, us, he gives us these good blessings, great blessings. All we have to do is come to him. Would you stand with your heads bowed this morning? Father, thank you for your word and for telling us about this church in Philadelphia and for showing us the manner in which they lived. It sounds like, Jesus, they had it a lot easier than, or a lot harder than I do. I, I'm not surrounded by people trying to shut our church down. I don't worry about people killing Christians in Jefferson City, Tennessee. But Lord, those days may come, and I, even if they don't, help me to stand. When it's not convenient, help me to stand for truth. When it's, when it's not safe, help us to trust you and do what's right. Lord, I, I pray that you would give those in our church today struggling with instability. Those who are struggling with sin. Those who are struggling with fear. Give them a a nudge from your Holy Spirit. Lord, remind them of your goodness and your desire to bless their lives with your good with your good hand. I pray for the lost that might be here today or listening to us today online. Help them to come to Christ. Lord, whatever your will is for this message in my heart, in the heart of our church family, would you do it? Make us sensitive to to you in every way. We pray in your name. Amen. Would you hold your head bowed for just a couple of minutes? We're not going to tarry very long. I appreciate your attention this morning, but this is perhaps one of the most important parts of our service. And this is the invitation for you to come and and respond to what you've heard and what God's spirit might be doing in your heart this morning. Some of you need to come and you need to confess sin in your life that's hindering your Christian walk. That's just the truth. I'm not trying to be rude or ugly. But we need, to, we need to be honest with God about our spiritual condition. God does not have full control of your life. You know it. He knows it. I may not know it. The person you live with may not know it. Would you come today and let God have full control, Christian? Just yield to him. I know that's hard. We want to be in control. Let God have control in your life. Some of you might be wondering if you're really going to heaven or not. This would be a great day to be saved. Paul said, even 2,000 years ago, Paul said, this is the day of salvation. This is the day to make that decision. If you're wondering when to be saved, may I tell you, it's right now. While it's available to you. While you have a mind that can respond to God. While you have air in your lungs. If God is working in your heart, would you step out today and come? Let him have his way. Full full lead in your life you do what God would have you do would you you're wondering this morning if it's the Holy Spirit tugging at you I'm telling you it probably is if you're wondering that It is the Holy Spirit. He's that personal. You you let him have his way, would you? Would you let him have his way in your heart?
Amen. Thank you. You can look up this way. I hope you, I hope you appreciate Philadelphia. That's the best church of the seven. It, it, it's not going to get any better in Philadelphia. Um, and I'll tell you this. Come back tonight. We're going to the other end of the spectrum. Um, you know, uh, you, you may not know a whole lot about Sardis or Smyrna or even Philadelphia. But if you know anything about the book of Revelation chapters 2 and 3, you know about church, church at Laodicea. It is not a good, that, that's church you don't want to be part of. Um, God has nothing good to say about them. He has good things to say to them, but he has nothing good to say about them. And here's the sad part. You and I are living in what is known as the Laodicean age. He's talking to this time period. The church generally around 1900, 1910, through the rapture. And all we have seen is a spiritual decline, generally speaking, in churches. Well, we're talking about Laodicea tonight. That's not a very good buildup for you to come back, but come back tonight and see what God has to say to this church, all right? Brother Mike's coming. He's got some announcements. going to close us out in prayer. Please greet our guests this morning and uh, thank them for coming. It's good to see each one of you here. I did want, Let me make one announcement that I forgot to tell Mike. Um, Ken Jacobs mentioned to me a minute ago um, about uh, the Isaiah uh, 117 house. Are any of you familiar with that today? They're having uh, an open house or a dedication or something today, I believe, at 2 o'clock. And if you are interested in going to that, Ken and Cheryl know about that. I think their daughter's volunteering over there. It's a new ministry here in Jeff City, uh, opened up recently. Um, and they're, they're doing something today at 2 uh, at their facility. Um, I'm sorry I don't have any more details. That was just given to me right before church. You can probably look them up online and get those. Thank the Lord for Google, right? Uh, if you're interested in that, you can find that online. Thanks for being here, church. Hasn't it been a good series on the churches there in Revelation? And, uh, you know, we, we need to be gleaning from these messages and, and seeing how we can apply those personally to our own personal life. Today at 4 o'clock, the deacons and officers will be meeting uh, in the fellowship room, uh, first Sunday of the month. That's uh, our normal meeting for men. Uh, the Amazing Grazing Fellowship, that will be this Friday at Mug and Mason here in Jefferson City. Uh, they'll be meeting there at 11 a.m. There is a sign-up sheet out here in the foyer, so if you'll sign up for that so they can let the restaurant know how many people to prepare for. Daylight savings time, the time that we always look forward to, is coming next uh, weekend. So next Sunday, 2 a.m. is the time that the official time that you set your clock, but I usually do that before I go to bed. Uh, and then the ABSF, Dr. Manley's class, uh, breakfast fellowship at Shoney's in Dandridge. That is two weeks from yesterday, Saturday morning, uh, March the 18th at 10 a.m. Uh, there again, there is a sign-up uh, sheet there in the foyer, so if you'd sign up for that there again so they can let the restaurant know how, to, how many to prepare for. Uh, and just check your bulletin for other announcements and check the sign-up sheets. I'm sure there's plenty of others out there you can put your name on. Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the opportunity that we have each week to, to fellowship in your house and to hear from your word. Father, just uh, this time that we can edify one another and be surrounded by like believers. Father, I pray that you would just help us to honor you and to take from the message today and apply it to our personal life. Father, that we may be better servants for you. Father, be with us as we part ways. I pray, Lord, that uh, you would just protect us, bring us back at the next appointed time. Thank you for what you're doing through the ministry here at Faith Baptist Church. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.